Welcome to GovCast. I am your host, Managing Editor Amy Kluber. Stephanie, thank you for joining us on GovCast. Thank you for having me. So you've been at GSA for 15 years. What brought you to the agency to begin with? Well, I joined GSA actually right out of college. I was debating whether or not to get a master's in mathematics or get a job in the real world. I actually applied online before we had USA Jobs and everything else like that. Oh, man, the dark ages. <laughs> yes, the dark <laughs> the dark ages. I think it was like through one of the career one. I, I can't even remember. It's been so long. But I remember applying at college kind of almost in a panic of, oh, no, I have to become an adult. Something has to change. So I did apply in true kind of government. It went kind of back and forth. I didn't really know what I was doing. I just knew it sounded interesting. And I was, after a couple of phone interviews and then in-person interviews, I was hired and I was hired basically to be what's called an industrial operations analyst. And they're the people who do compliance of our contractors on contract, but they also provide education. And that was one of my things that I really liked doing was providing that education and helping contractors. And then when we talked to agencies, we found out, especially with some tools like eBuy, they would guess what area to put things under. We have these things called special item numbers, which is a weird numbering system that we made up and no one understands other than us. And agencies would just randomly pick one because it was a guessing game for them as well. And they'd be like, well, that looks like a good number. Boom. And they'd send it out and industry would come back and be like, but this isn't what we sell. Or, hey, we sell that, but we can't. Like, what do we do with this? So we knew that there was a massive duplication. We knew that there was a consistency issue. So we actually looked at all the offerings and we're like, okay, let's see. We were actually were going to go to just a lower number of schedules. Unfortunately, there are companies on there that cross into every single one of the 24. And then the offerings crossed into every single one. Tw- and we were kind of like, well, we could do this and we could move this down. But this really needs this. Okay, well, no, that doesn't work. Bring that over as well. And then in the end, we were like, okay, we just have to do one because we can't. There, It's just too complicated to figure out where those lines would be. So we decided to go to one. We had the workforce actually provide this decision. So we created a huge team, had like 80 people on it. In the end, I think because it's currently still going on, we have like 140 now participating on it. So we have all these sub teams and different things that are happening. But we basically had them vote on what they wanted to do. And they all ended up going, we have to go to one. So then we had the workforce on board. So then we took it to management and we had them vote on it. And they were like, yeah, we have to go to one. So then we had both sides on it. We were like, okay, I think this is the first time we've ever came to the same decision, everyone. So we should just really do this because I don't know if we'll ever be on the same page ever again. So that's kind of how we made that decision. And then it just got to the point where, okay, now we got to figure out how to do it. And that was the next step of what we did. It's a a whole nother beast. Yes. (laughs) Doing and thinking is always so different. (laughs) How does this consolidation fit into the the overall federal marketplace strategy? So the federal marketplace is this initiative that was born out of an idea. And the idea is, I'm the federal government, I need to buy something. Instead of going to 800 different places or guessing or making up my own contract, maybe there should be one place you go and one place you decide, oh, this works, there's a contract available. I should go there and do that. And then from an industry perspective, you should be able to come to the government and say, I want to sell to the government. And maybe you don't need to get every contract in the world. Maybe you really just need one. And then you can provide your solutions, products, services, whatever that is to the federal government. And we can connect everyone together. And we looked at this initiative and we're like, okay, we got to get everyone on board. We got to do all this stuff. But then we looked in our own house and we're like, We got a lot of things going on that kind of go opposite of this idea. So with mass consolidation, it was one of those things of like, we need to put forth an effort to show that we're going to streamline the situation. We are going to make a federal marketplace that works for industry to come to agencies and agencies to find industry in a simpler way. And it was kind of one of those things of, 
this is a really good initiative and we'd like other people to buy in on it, but we really have to take the first step to show that we can also do that. So you recently achieved sort of a milestone by October 1st. What was that milestone? So on October 1st, we released the new solicitation. It will be the, cons- it's the consolidated solicitation. So basically the 24 legacy ones are no longer we're accepting offers against. We are only accepting offers at this time against the new contract. It includes all the terms and conditions from all the 24 contracts. It just simplifies them down. So we did have some terms and conditions that was the same term, but it was done like 12 different ways. So instead of doing 12 different ways, we said, okay, pick one. And so then we put that in there so that all of that would be consistent. And then we broke it up actually by category because the other thing we found out is There's a lot of stuff in these solicitations that don't really make sense, especially if you're not a government person and you don't speak government all day long. So we wanted to make it so when you read it, if you were selling office supplies, maybe you don't need to read through all of the things about cybersecurity to sell pencils. Maybe you could just go to office management and, oh, these are the terms I need to look at. So we did break it out by category for that, but it is one massive solicitation that now everyone will kind of have the same path to get on contract and you will only need one. And the goal was October 1st. We were able to deliver on October 1st. I was extremely just excited about that. It's just so rare that you're able to meet a deadline and have such quality of work that these teams put into it and have the workforce really come together and work as one team to do all of this together and everyone have this buy-in and deliver a really good product in the time that you said you were going to and not have to set out something, well, (laughs) just kidding, (laughs) but actually be able to deliver on that date. And so that was something that I think everyone who participated and anyone who touched this project was super proud about, that we could actually do something and do it on our own. So you've touched on the fact that this was a huge team collaboration, which I think is interesting that not everyone kind of highlights the workforce aspect of a project or initiative. What are some of the lessons learned that you took out of this or maybe some of your teammates took out of this? One of them is helping everyone get on the same page is always very important. But listening to everyone's experiences, especially people who do it every single day, it changes how you actually view a project. Having everyone piece things together rather than a small team siloed off telling everyone what's best for them, but actually having everyone contribute to it and having people on various other teams be that spokesperson for you rather than you having to talk to everyone, it just helps get that buy-in at a level that I just was not prepared for. It has been amazing to watch all these people work. And it's been amazing to watch people who came into the project kind of with an attitude of, this is never going to happen. And then by the end, be some of the biggest champions of, oh, we're going to get this done. If it kills us, we will get this done. And watching people that when you have that piece of you that's involved in something like this, that you are contributing to, makes that success so much more achievable because you have so many people pushing it and you're not on your own. And I think that always makes people feel happier. It's always terrifying to be the one sole person out there. And I always tell people I work with, if you have a million people taking credit for what you're doing, you're doing something right. If no one wants to take credit for what you're doing, (laughs) you may want to rethink what you're saying. There's kind of this thing of like, if people just start, oh, of course I did that. Of course let them have it, like let them take that credit because it's a better fight with everyone in it and everyone receiving credit than just one or two people. It always works out more for everyone. So in this first phase, what what were some of the challenges you encountered that you maybe weren't expecting? I think the biggest challenge we had is the special item numbers. (laughs) I don't know who created them and I don't know who came up with the numbering system of them, but It is something that has carried on and no one understands. Like we'd be like, okay, well, how did you get to this number? And they're like, I don't know. So-and-so said all the other numbers are like this. So we decided to go with it. 
figuring out how the NAICS codes align to them was also a little bit of chaos. But reviewing the NAICS codes themselves and the size standards associated with the NAICS codes and how they're broken up, I looked at it and I'd always kind of read into it and everything. But once we were like deep into it, I was like, wow, nothing we do makes sense. (laughs) So trying to make sense of something and create a methodology that someone could come in the future and be like, oh, we need a new whatever. We know we don't already have it because of these NAICS codes are not being used. We can put it together because we're going to map it to that NAICS code. Having that methodology is something that we hadn't had in the past And I'm hoping that will help us not get out of control in the future because we started adding special item numbers more on requests from agencies than whether or not we should, which is always great because it helps that agency. But at the same time, that's what added to that duplication a little bit. But the 24 legacy schedules had about 900 SINs. The new one has 320. And we kept the scope of everything. So you can see that duplication across the program just in that. But I would say that task required so many teams and required just review after review. And there were days that I was like, this is the thing that's going to get us. And the fact that we were able to finally wrangle it in, I was just so thrilled <laughs> on so many levels with that. So what kind of feedback have you received through this process, whether it's from stakeholders or contractors, or maybe even from your own team? So we received a lot of really good feedback from industry that have especially been on board and watching the entire time. Some of the more nervous feedback are industry that are now in the midst of, oh, something happened. I have no clue. I don't read emails from you. Things like that. Or what happens with this? Or they get ahead of themselves. Or people who've made situations so complex that you kind of have to walk them back and you have to kind of explain things. Most people who come in who are nervous or anxious about things, whether it be an agency, a workforce member, or industry, once we kind of talk it out or email them back, they seem to come back with a, oh, never mind. It's not as important as I thought it was going to be. It's not as stressful as this is going to be. So we've tried really hard to do anything in our power to reduce the burden on all parties involved. Obviously, you can't have zero burden across the boards, but trying to get that below, but also be a little bit more transparent with communication, answering questions, even if we don't know the answer to the question, talking out the problem at the very least, and then coming back later with an answer. I think that's helped a lot, but I do know As we continue to go through until probably July of next year, when we start actually consolidating and different things start happening, I think there will always be a little bit of stress because before things happen, it's always panic. You don't know what you're panicked about, but there's something you should panic about is kind of how people feel sometimes. So trying to get to the point where everyone is on the same page and feels happy And realizes basically they don't have to climb a mountain to get this done, that it will be a little gradual, will have it be a little bit more organic and get to the place where it needs to be. But every day, I'm sure I get at least one email of panic that someone has sent, whether it's industry, agencies, or the workforce, and just making sure that we continue to put out communications on it is the main thing that we've been trying to do. Well, you mentioned in your previous roles that you were more involved in kind of the education aspect Mm -hmm. of things. Is this an area where you think that comes into play? Yes. I mean, that definitely has helped me a lot because it is one thing that I learned a long time ago. So when I was in college, my degree is in math, but I had to teach every once in a while. That's one of the reasons I did not go into math. (laughs) It's teaching large classrooms. Oh, no. was not my... (laughs) I'm much better at it now, but when I was in college, I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this because no one wants to go to math class either. So you have that element. (laughs) But learning to actually listen to someone's full question before I answer has been something, and I still work on it to this day, but being able to do that so that I can educate them on what they need to be educated on and not fill in an entire backstory for them, I think has helped me immensely in this project and other things. 
And it's helped me personally gain trust of various people that I've, for lack of words, suckered into this project to come help me so that I can create these trust bonds with different people so that everyone can come to the table and do things together. But it is one thing that it took a very long time to learn. And I'm I'm sure like if you talk to someone, anyone, they'll start with the question. And as they're trying to formulate it, if you don't have the patience to listen, you just want to answer for them. And they're like, no, that's not what I'm asking. (laughs) So trying to continue to do that is something that's very important, especially right now. Can you outline what the program's next steps are? We just passed this first milestone. What do the next two phases look like? So we've just started phase two. Phase two is getting everyone who currently has a contract onto the new contract. And that basically is just cleaning up some terms and conditions on their contracts. And we're looking to do that in January. We'll be issuing a mass modification is what we call it. Mass as in to the masses, not mass as the program, which is always confusing for everyone. (laughs) So we'll be sending that out to everyone that will update the terms and conditions The one thing we won't be doing is there will be no contract number changes, no priceless changes. All of these negotiated factors will stay the same. This way, agencies don't have to change orders. They don't have to change blanket purchase agreements. Anything that's in process will remain in process and not be disrupted. But our main focus right now is getting that mass modification out so that we can get all of everyone who's on the legacy contracts onto these new terms and conditions. And once that's done, that will end phase two. And then we'll also be working between that January and July date, making sure things like eBuy map to both sides of the house so that if you're an agency and you only like the old numbering system, you can still use it. If you don't have any clue about any of the numbering system, you can continue to guess but we'll map it to all the different things that you need to have it. And then in phase three, we'll be doing a complete update in eBuy to move us to a large and subcategory arena so that agencies will be looking for words and allow industry to come with actual solutions rather than pinpointing into something that an industry partner may have a difficulty staying in that box to provide what they need. So we're hoping to get basically everyone on to the new terms and conditions by July so that we can start phase three, which is just update some various systems, eBuy, eLibrary, taking the 24 legacy schedules off of eLibrary so you just see the one mass contract. And then we'll be reaching out to industry and say, you need to get to one contract. And that will be the start of phase three. And our goal is to have sometime during 2021, basically an agreement or document from each contractor who has more than one contract of how they're going to get down to one so that we can have that on file. Because this way we don't have to disrupt any orders. So there's going to be some contractors who have three or four contracts where some of them may not have sales. Some of them may have different things where they'll know which ones they want to cancel and which ones they know they want to do full modifications to, to add new special item numbers, add scope, add price lists, add whatever they need to, to make that contract what I lovingly refer to as their ride and die contract. And then they'll know which ones they want that they don't necessarily need anymore. And then they'll slowly start figuring out what those cancellation dates are going to be. And that will help us get down to one without disrupting any work that's going on currently, which means agencies aren't going to see hardly any effect until they go into eBuy after July. And that's going to be when they start saying, oh, I have to select words rather than a random number, which will be something that they can hopefully adjust to. Once everything is done and completed and you've gotten through this entire project, what is that going to look like? So once we get through this project, I really kind of view this as the foundational project of mass. We'll be getting us down to one vehicle. We'll be getting to breaking down those silos, a consistent contract, lack of duplication. Now we can actually start our continuous improvement projects. We've tried to update systems. We've tried to update different processes multiple times through the years. We usually cancel the project. The reason being is because everything's slightly different 
you can't finish. So now that we have everyone on the same, we actually can start tackling those issues that we've had in the past, whether that be updates to systems, whether that be updates to process, whether that be really digging into some of these clauses to see if they're really the best worded the best way that they need to be worded, or do we need to go through some rulemaking to change these clauses to make them work for everyone and benefit everyone involved. So these are some of the things we'll be looking at when we set our next priority list once we get through this basically foundation reset, for lack of a better way of putting it, because then we'll all be on the same level and same playing field, and we will actually be able to make changes where right now everyone's in so many different worlds. It's kind of like, okay, let's just let the dust settle right now. And then once that happens, we can create a whole new list of everything in the world we need to fix. <laughs> so at a act act meeting you spoke at in October, you said the VA schedules won't be affected by the consolidation. Mm-hmm. Why is that? So the VA schedules are delegated to the VA. We very much try and allow them to run their contracts. Their contracts have various different terms and conditions. They have some of very unique contracts that have very unique ordering procedures. One of those would be pharmaceuticals and medical supplies that have these just different rules that may or may not be able to mesh into this to begin with, but also they have a different fee structure than we do. They have different contract lengths. It's just, there's so much different. We would really have to think about how we would reset that program to ever do that. And we would definitely need the VA to want to do that. So for right now, I thought it'd be best for us to get our stuff clean before we made anyone else do anything. But this way, if the VA ever wanted to join us, awesome. If they want to keep them separate, awesome. They're delegated to them. They should be able to do with what they need to do with them. And anything we can do to help them is something that I'm always interested in doing. So what le- led you to pursue a pre-aerospace engineering degree? <laughs> yes, I, have, I feel like that's the oddest, the oddest thing in the world. Thing yeah, in your it resume. is. <laughs> yeah. So in Utah, where I grew up, and it's ironic because my niece is kind of similar to me, which I thought was interesting because she had a list of things she wanted to accomplish by her bed when I went home a couple months ago. And I was like, oh, look, you're kind of like me. (laughs) I had this dream when I was younger to work at NASA. And Utah State University has a NASA Space Dynamics Lab that if you do the aerospace engineering degree, it feeds directly into that government agency. So the junior college I decided to go to because it was cheaper. (laughs) The main reason of life that I decided to go to had a pre-aerospace engineering associate's degree that fed good standing straight into that program. So I was like, okay, this is it. We're going to do it. And I took the 23 plus credits a semester and worked every second of every day doing it for two years, got the degree and went to Utah State and was like, this is what I'm going to do and got halfway through and was like, I don't like any of what I'm doing. Oh, no. I need to find something I actually want to do. And so that's when I realized I'm going to have to switch to a major that I have the most something in. And I realized that math and process was something I was very interested in. And, and it kind of got me to doing a math degree and a stats degree, especially related to process, which ironically funnels in here. I do know how to do percentages very well, which I have found is a lost talent for a lot of people. But yeah, no, it it was this whole dream of working for NASA. Ironically, in act when I was in the Voyagers program, my mentor was from NASA. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is the closest I'm ever going to get. <laughs> so, but I had had this entire, your senior year in high school and you map out your whole life and then you get halfway through and we're like, I'm a completely different person than I was in high school. Should probably change some things up. So, <laughs> but yeah, it was a dream for a little bit. <laughs> well, so you, you didn't get around to, I guess, building space shuttles. No. Nope. <laughs> that, that analytical mind, I guess, does play into what you're doing now with mm-hmm. uh, building your team and solving some of these challenges. It definitely helps, especially with process improvement, documenting process, creating theories, testing your theory 
demonstrating what worked and what didn't. And I think the biggest thing I took from it is don't come to what you want your answer to be and then build a case to your answer. Figure out what the problem is and then figure out your answer from your case. Because that's one of the things that in math, stats, engineering, no matter what it is, that's the problem solving way. So it is definitely something when anyone comes to me, but the answer is this. I'm like, well, it might be. We don't know yet. So making sure that we do projects in a way where we can go through all the different steps of things and then come back and say, okay, we went through all these steps. These are the 10 possible ways we could go. Can we narrow it down? And going through those different types of, for lack of a better word, testing is something that I know my entire group that I work with has slowly started to do as well. So it's kind of our whole group has now become this group of like, well, we've got to have to test this theory out before we go any further. And I definitely got that from doing those different. So if there's maybe one misconception or something that the government or contracting community doesn't know about the consolidation schedule that you hope was answered in this episode, what would that be? Don't make it harder than it is. Definitely the biggest thing. If you already have a contract, don't get a new one just to get a new one. Only get a new contract if you actually need one. And wait and see. Don't panic yet. And if you have questions, we do have an email box, masspmo at gsa.gov. Ask your questions. Don't sit panicked in a dark room by yourself. Bring your panic at least to us so that we can address it. Well, if I had any questions about this consolidation schedule, I, I'm sure... Now I will never have another one again after this. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. This was a great conversation, and I'm, I'm so happy to have learned more about you and the initiative in general. Thank you so much for having me. GovCast is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to governmentcio.com slash podcasts. GovCast is produced and hosted by Amy Kluber. It is edited by Resonate Recordings. Theme music provided by Big Hoax. If you're interested in sponsoring a podcast, contact us at sponsor at governmentcio.com. Governmentcio.com.